Good afternoon, everyone. This is Danny Henson, and it is Sabbath, March the 6th, 2021. So, I know it's been a while since I've done a live video, and so let me explain to you what inspired me, or at least compelled me, uh, to, uh, to make a video today. Um, it's Sabbath. I spent a good deal of time in Bible study last night with a group of friends, Jason Bohr and, uh, and several others, and I'm so thankful for that. I want to reach out to you guys, let you know, really enjoyed our study last night. But there's other studies that I participate with, specifically, every Saturday afternoon at my former church, Cross Plains, Tennessee, there's a Bible study. Uh in relationship to end time events that's held in the afternoon at that church. And leading out in that study is my brother and my previous video Bible study partner, Rowdy Schmidt. And um, as we've been separated, it's been a tremendous blessing to me to be able to watch that Bible study live at the um, Cross Plains Church from week to week as he records um, live their study. And uh, it's tremendous. Rowdy has just um, got a very sharp analytical mind in the way that he studies scripture and uh, related materials has always intrigued me. I've always been impressed with how the, the Lord has gifted him. And so I've been watching for weeks and, and months these studies unfold, and they've been a blessing to me. Um, as I'm convinced, they have been a tremendous blessing to those in attendance. Um, but obviously, as you're having a discussion and you're studying new materials, there are always going to be questions and even sometimes um, some disagreements about how to interpret or, or to understand the information being received. So sometimes it gets quite interesting to watch the discussion because uh, not not everyone is always in 100% lockstep with the, with the other. So it makes for good conversation. I think that's necessary. So there was a study last Saturday afternoon. As a matter of fact, that was the first study back from like a month-long break. And I was so happy and excited to be able to watch that study Saturday afternoon. Uh, and But as I watched it, some of the material or some of the discussion turned um, to something that I have taken into consideration um, in the last several months. Um, as much of, most of you are aware, um, we have been in the midst of a pandemic and the world, not just our country, but the world has dramatically changed as a result of this pandemic. And it's been curious to watch and, and at times um, disturbing and perplexing. And there's one particular issue as it relates to God's people, as it relates to his church, that has been somewhat troubling to me. And I've been trying to parse out this issue in my brain. Interestingly enough, last week at Rowdy's study, or at the Cross Plains um, End Time Events Bible study, this subject came up. And it was interesting to see uh, the differences in perspectives on this issue. And the issue in question, or, or that which I, uh, I'd like to at least consider briefly this afternoon, is that of restrictions that have been placed on American citizens in respect to being able to gather together and uh, in general, but most specifically for the sake of worship. And I'm, I'm not certain there's a right or wrong answer that I'm looking for today as, as uh, I share a couple things with you. It's just been concerning to me. There are there are elements of the behavior that's been witnessed over the course of the last few months 
that have been disturbing. And, and why would it be disturbing? Well, um, I'm a patriotic American citizen for the most part and am very proud of the fact that this country established a Bill of Rights and a Constitution by which a standard would be set to protect the rights of the people. Th this, this Bill of Rights and this Constitution was not written for the sake of supplying power to government. It was actually um, boundaries that were set in place to keep the government from infringing on the rights of the populace or of the citizenry. And it's interesting, if you read the First Amendment, what you'll find is a safeguard against the government, as it says, or as it reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a regress of grievances. So the First Amendment provides protection to the citizenry against an establishment of any type of religion, but protecting the free exercise of any type of religion. It goes on to provide us the right of speech, the right of assembly, and it's this particular constitutional law, along with some others, that are currently being challenged in the United States of America. And because of the pandemic, most of you are aware that for a time, churches were ordered closed to protect the people, or at least that's what we were told, to protect us from the spread of this deadly pandemic. So, you know, when this was ongoing, I started to consider Scripture and what it says about the necessity of assembling for the purpose of worship. And, and you know, the Bible provides some guidance. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 26, it says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, and he's talking about the breaking of bread naturally, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So there, there's an interesting command or piece of instruction that's given to God's people in respect to communion. Now, in my particular community of faith, it is our custom, as it would be, about quarterly or, or once every three months during our worship, we participate in foot washing, the act of humility, and in the breaking of bread and communion, drinking the water, receiving the broken bread. And we do this in remembrance of Christ as he instructed us to do. So one of the fundamental elements of coming together in communion for the sake of worship is to follow the instructions that we were given by our master. Another interesting piece of counsel that we've received through scripture would be found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more, so much more as you see the day approaching. 
what day is being spoken of here in the book of Hebrews. I would suggest to you that it's the day of the Christ coming. Now, raise your hand if you believe that we are rapidly approaching the time of Christ's coming. Have you put the pieces together? Have you studied Bible prophecy? Are you aware that these events that we see unfolding on our planet, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence and disease and so forth, the increase of these things, as it were like birth pains on a woman with child. Now what's that mean? Well, what happens when a woman has a child? She has birth pains. They become increasingly more severe and intense and closer together until the culminating event where the baby's birthed. Well, that's what the Bible suggests would happen at the end of time, just before the return of Jesus Christ, in respect to these things. And that is exactly what we're witnessing in the world today. Now, I'm not a date setter, and I don't think it's important that we know precisely when, but shouldn't we understand the signs of the times? So given that to be the case not forsaking the assembling ourselves together in, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see that day approaching. That's my contention that worship is essential. Why? Why is it essential? It's essential because iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We come together to pray, to confess our sins one to another, the Bible tells us to do, and to pray for one another so that we might be strengthened, so that we might hear a word of encouragement and be strengthened by it, to be inspired. Christ said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. So it's in these gatherings, these assemblies, where Christ is lifted up, that people are drawn to him, that people are encouraged and inspired to be obedient to him, to sacrifice for his sake and for others. Iron sharpens iron. You just have to put the two together before the process could be completed. This essentially is, is the purpose for these gatherings. So as I witnessed this thing happening in our country where we were being commanded by our political class not to assemble for the sake of the common good of the people because of the, the pandemic and the health crisis, I was torn, I was perplexed because First and foremost, our politicians do not have the right to deprive us of our constitutional rights, our con constitutional protections. They just don't have the power. But the, the populace just allowed this to happen, J just went right along with it because of fear. It's interesting how many times Jesus instructed his disciples to fear not. I mean, after all, church, is Jesus in the boat during this storm? Or did we lose him somewhere along the way and we do not have the blessing and protection that was promised? It's just troubling to me because my past experiences have informed my current level of faith and belief in the promises given. So I have to believe that Christ is able to bring us through a pandemic. There was a pandemic in Egypt, and Israel was protected through that pandemic. Furthermore, I'm not diminishing the danger of this pandemic virus. I personally have lost 
three people that I cared about, three people that were impactful in my life, three people who I loved from the coronavirus. I've had other people that are close to me, people that I love, that have suffered from the virus, either by losing someone close to them or by, by having to be sick and overcoming sickness themselves. So I'm not diminishing in any way the deadly nature of this virus or any other virus for that matter. I just question, I just question the fact that we were so willing, so quickly willing to set aside our constitutional rights in order to obey the dictates of a government that has proven itself, if nothing else, to be untrustworthy. You know, here's an interesting story um, from Louisiana. It was in the national news some time back. Pastor defies house arrest order and again leads services at his church. A Louisiana pastor held services in his church Sunday, defying house arrest in order that uh, in orders that followed an assault charge related to his decision to hold mass gatherings in defiance of public health order, orders during the coronavirus pandemic. So so here's this pastor who's not from my faith community catching a charge and being arrested because he would not submit to the government's attempt to thwart him from and his followers or his uh, um, the members of, of his church from practicing their constitutional right, constitutional right to assemble. You know, it's just... Just crazy if you think about it. That we're living in a country where laws are, are firmly established to protect us and our God-given rights. And during the course of this pandemic, good people who just wanted to gather together to assemble peaceably to worship the one true God were persecuted by our government for doing so. I think the most embarrassing thing for me is that I, I never heard one story from my faith community, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or any of its pastors, um, challenging the unconstitutional authority of the government in the same manner as this pastor, who I'm assuming was a Roman Catholic possibly or some type of Orthodox Christian religion because it says that he uh, intended to lead a mass. I'm ashamed of it. I'm a little bit ashamed that nobody from my community of faith made the news or even one of our publications for having defied the government in protest for our constitutional rights and our God-given rights to assemble, especially giving the express command in Scripture to do that very thing. Now, that wasn't always true. September 15th, 1889, the Sentinel Library, which was a publication of the Pacific Press Publishing Company, and it shares the story of Alonzo T. Jones, who was a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and um, who was the editor of one of our major publications. He went before the United States Senate and a committee on education and labor 
on December 13th of 1888 because there was an attempt to pass a national Sunday law, which was unconstitutional. It would have been an establishment of religion. And A.T. Jones very eloquently went before the Senate and defended our faith and the faith once given to the saints in that constitutionally um, or that Senate committee group. And as a result, the, the law was put down. In other words, it did not pass. There was not an establishment of a national Sunday law. Alonzo Trevor Jones was a defender of the faith and of our constitutional liberties. So I guess you could say it was a tradition amongst our people at one time to defend your God-given rights and to defend your ability to worship according to your conscience. And it's troubling to me that we haven't been more vocal to defend those rights. Now, obviously, I'm all for social distancing and wearing masks and taking every possible precaution to keep everyone safe. But I'd like us to contemplate some of these things because it may be soon and very soon that we face some of these same challenges again in the future. Should we stand up in defiance to tyranny? Should we stand up when our constitutional rights are being trampled upon and dismissed? I would suggest to you that if you don't fight for something, that you'll fall for everything. And to my Christian community, I just encourage you to, to make this a matter of prayer to take these things into consideration, to reflect on the recent events of history and allow that to help us to inform our positions and the way that we acquit ourselves in the future when faced with similar challenges. Because <laughs> believe me now or listen to me now, believe me later, this isn't the end we're going to face similar, if not much more dramatic circumstances in the future. And we need to remind ourselves, acquit ourselves to the principles of Scripture, those that are also enshrined in our Constitution so that we are properly prepared to face these challenges in the future. Whether it be at the ballot box or in front of news cameras, or as we're being drug off to jail. We have to stand upon our convictions. And in a way, I feel that thus far during this current conflict, um, we may have lost some critical ground by not taking a stand for what's right and what's true. And I'm to blame, I suppose just as much as anyone else. Uh, and I have to confess I'm a little bit ashamed uh, because I allowed panic and fear to short-circuit wisdom and rational thought. Um, it dulled my convictions and, and didn't allow me to see things as it is often easier to do in hindsight. So uh, I'd like for you to take into consideration some of the things uh, that we've looked at this afternoon. And uh, I think it's appropriate that we enter into a season of prayer and reevaluate our conviction uh, to stand on principle and on the Word of God. Yep. Thanks for spending time with me this afternoon. Hope you have a blessed day and a tremendously blessed week. God bless you. You're